Worried about keeping up with your fave friends all summer? Or posting every perfectly pink sunset you see? Don't sweat the connect. You can have it made in the shade with four lines of unlimited data for $100 a month. Scroll the staycation pics, find your new go-to takeout spot, or catch some rays on video chat. Whatever you and the crew are into, all the data makes it all that much better. Smile, you're on Cricket. Cricket Core acquired on four lines. Data speed limited to three megabits per second. Cricket may slow data speeds when the network is busy. Additional fees, usage, and restrictions apply. Big Mac, Chicken McNuggets. No, Big Mac and Quarter Pounder with cheese. Or filet fish You'd be doing the same thing if you were at McDonald's because you can choose not just one, but two of your favorites for just six bucks. Tasty Big Mac, crispy 10-piece Chicken McNuggets, juicy Quarter Pounder with cheese, or savory filet fish Enjoy two of your all-time favorites for just six bucks, if you can decide on the two. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. Single item at regular price. Whether you're black or white, whether you're country, redneck or freak, young or old, from Moscow, London or Memphis, Elvis Presley will still be the king of rock and roll to me. Welcome to The Jungle Room Season 4, brought to you by Sassy Girl Apparel in Horn Lake, Mississippi. And now, here are your hosts, Mike Ford and Jamie Kay. Well, Jamie Kay, it's a week that uh, Elvis fans always recognize but don't necessarily enjoy. That's right. Uh, this week is marking the 43rd year since Elvis Presley died. And this is the week known as Elvis Week. And as you know, I was supposed to be down in Memphis right now, but because of the pandemic, I'm not. And right now, a lot of our fellow Elvis fans are in Memphis and they are, you know, taking up that energy that Elvis left behind. Having been down there uh, to Memphis and to Graceland and just to, to even go by Sun Studios, you know, if someone's never had a chance to do it, I definitely encourage you to, to make at least one one pilgrimage uh, down there. It's something right at sun, sunset, too, especially. Mm-hmm. It's just a pretty, pretty amazing, amazing place. You know, I was just pondering how old was Gladys when she passed? It was like 42, right? No, she was actually 46. Oh, she was 46. Okay. So I knew knew it was close Mm -hmm. as far as age. The whole situation with his passing, I was watching a little bit of your YouTube the other day Mm -hmm. about the dark side. Oh, yes. Right. Elvis. And... It uh, sounded like you had a lot of good feedback from folks and their thoughts about his benevolence, but also what it stemmed from, you know, was that insecurity, mm-hmm. right? And I think a lot of that, too, is when you look at, you know, the American dream of having it all, and when that dream actually materializes after a sequence of sequence of events, it's almost surreal i would imagine especially when it got to the level that it did for elvis Mm -hmm. you know especially you know it was it was almost a meteoric rise in the 50s you know because he wasn't the first white guy to do rhythm and blues bill haley beat him to that Mm -hmm. but he took it to that next level you know he took it to the international level there was something about elvis that people no matter if they liked him or not, he resonated with individuals all over the world. That is the the making of a star. That's the making of a legend. When, yes, he wasn't the first, but he was the most relatable in some way, in some way, in some spiritual connection, if you will. Elvis Presley was able to touch millions and millions of people so much that we are still talking about him to this day. He's more famous now in 2020 than he was in 1977. I think he's even more famous today than he was in his heyday. And that's because legends grow. Very true. I was thinking also today about uh, when you were interviewing his bodyguard. Uh, Dave Hepler. Yeah, Dave Hepler. How do you save someone from themselves? Right. That really... I mean, that's like, that could be said for so many people who achieve celebrity, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, and even from the get-go, 
he had his mom's concern about the women that were coming into his life and his dedication to his mom. He caught a lot of flack from that when he was a kid. Of course. He rose to fame so quickly and at such a young age. I tend to believe that there was an emotional development that stopped growing at that time he rose to fame because all of a sudden this young kid who was raised in poverty and he then got shoved into this world of fame where no one would say no to him. And he was right. able to get everything and anything and anyone that he wanted. So that has to, I'm no psychologist, but that has to do a number on your head and your mentality. Sure. So I would, I would suggest that there's a dissonance or a disconnect that has to take place to survive. Mm -hmm. Right. Because of the pressure, because think of how many even at that early part of his career where he only had to worry about his family and maybe a few close friends. But I'm sure he always already began to feel the pressure. Oh, yeah. You know, what would be the next what would be the next step? Would it be the right step? Would I be able to take care of my mama and daddy, take care of everyone that I love? And then do they love me for me or right. do they love me for my image. So there's that part too. When you when you watch those recordings of him with Johnny Cash and um, Carl Perkins, uh, Carl Perkins, Jerry and Jer Lewis. yeah. Mm -hmm. When you watch those guys in those recordings, it's something. There's some sort of a switch that flips in all of them. Mm -hmm. From what I what I watch, right? It's like they they feel like they're these guys get them right. They know the same pressures. They're all at this launching pad almost right and at that time at that time he wasn't the king he was just a kid starting out and all of them were and so they were just like we're at the starting line and we're getting ready to blast off into this career and the whole rock and roll thing and i don't think that i don't know if it could have happened anywhere but down there in south in the south in memphis because of the confluent you know all those musical uh, influences it was almost like they came down the river to memphis you know so, mm -hmm. so you had you had your rhythm and blues and you had your country and all the things that he had listened to and the influences and of course the gospel you know that's another part that people forget well not the fans that listen to our show of course our podcast yeah. but of course. you know a lot of the other fans though forget that you know he had that such a such a huge gospel influence mm -hmm. too. So, you know, and that, that all had to weigh on him, uh, that whole deserving, do I deserve right. this? Game? And right? we, you know, we talked about that uh, last Saturday night on our YouTube channel on the live was part of his drug use. Was it because of the burden he was carrying because Elvis Presley was responsible for a lot of livelihoods. He sure. was financially responsible for a, a lot of people and their families. That has to weigh on you because you can't afford to fail. Nope. You, you can't afford to really screw up. That's why I asked the question, is, was Elvis Presley a self-sabotager? It was almost like he wanted to see how far he could push the boundaries of failure, almost to see if the people he surrounded himself by really loved him for him. Right. Would they stick around if there wasn't a paycheck? Obviously yeah. you can't in the real world do that. You can't give up everything just to live with your friend to prove that yeah. you're, you love them. But I can see the more drugs you take, the more, you know, you start playing mind games with yourself. But, you know, Elvis's drug use was, I feel it was to, cover up a lot of his feelings and and sure. to kind of escape from his own reality well remember too when all that started uh johnny cash was real heavy into the into drugs too for a time in the 60s yeah yeah and it was like a lot of that was the staying awake on those trips that's how it would start mm -hmm. you know but a lot of times too you got to think you know they just need to get out of their head for a little bit Right. Because I would imagine, take, how do you take that next step and stay up 
how do you fulfill the image? How do you how do you live up to an image that's being crafted? You know, we've had many discussions about Colonel Parker, and you know, I gotta say, being part of this show has actually changed my opinion, especially it's not after. Not clear now, is it? it there's no, a lot no, of gray I, area in the yeah, Elvis story, a, and a lot of it too is. And the other part that shows you how big Elvis was internationally, even though he never got to go over overseas other than the army, he never got to tour, do that world tour because of Colonel Parker. And so it was, um, yeah. Well, when we talked with Mark about that too, his views on Colonel Mark Christian from Dagger, yes. Yeah, about, uh, sorry, I just know him like Mark now, you know. Just to but, clarify for our listeners. Yes, thank you. I'm, okay. You know, when, when he was giving his views on Colonel Parker, because Mark, being the consummate musician, can see exactly the path that Colonel Parker was clearing and, and paving for Elvis. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's that's something that a lot of us don't have that background. But, you know, Mark's been through it all. He's done the recording part. He's done the performing part and the management part and all of that. So that that was really interesting to me to get that perspective on on Colonel Parker from him. And I'm actually going to enjoy watching Tom Hanks play him, I think. I, I think so. I've come full circle on that one, haven't I? Yes, you have. They have started production again with that movie. Um, you know, it was on pause for a long time because of the pandemic. Right. But, I, you know, I, hold, I withhold my judgment until the movie comes out. I know a lot of people on social media have been, you know, they already hate it and i just i feel like that's so premature like the movie's not even done yet let's wait till it comes out and then see elvis world is very polar though jamie (laughs) (laughs) right it can be it can be lines get drawn really quickly i've noticed well let's go back to august 16th 1977 now you were around in the 70s i was only eight months old when elvis died in my research with elvis presley i have noticed a discrepancy which is there's version one elvis presley was suicidal he was depressed he was heavily obese And then there's version two, where yes, he did get bloated from time to time. He had problems with water retention. We also know he had problems with his colon. So he, there would be times where he would seem more bloated than other times, but he was still a handsome man, a lively man, full of life, who was looking forward to his future. And it is these two versions that are so drastically apart from one another. Now, I know that we have the CBS special. And when you watch that, it it does make your heart skip a beat because the makeup they have on his face, it, it wasn't a good look for him. However, if you close your eyes and you listen to him sing, you still feel it. You see, he still yeah. had it. I spoke with Ian McKay. And if you go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the jungle room, and you watch my interview with Ian McKay, he was at Elvis Presley's last concert. And he was also in the audience at the CBS special. I'm sorry, he was interviewed and they showed his interview on the CBS special. So he he's seen both concerts, right? His version of the way Elvis looked and performed at his last concert doesn't fit the narrative that he was suicidal and depressed and lethargic on stage. Not in that last, you know, few months of his life. Yeah. Pose the question to you. I don't know if you remember, but what do you remember as a civilian, just looking at newspapers and and magazines of Elvis Presley? What was your interpretation of Elvis Presley in 1976 and 1977, if you had one? Well, I was in broadcast school and Elvis was still the king and we were playing as 45s. The interpretation of how it ends because if you think it was an accident, then somebody wasn't paying attention. And if you think it was suicidal, once again, somebody wasn't paying attention. Who wasn't paying attention? How do you put the responsibility of a grown man's yeah. being well, alive or well, not? It, it's, it's just well, mind boggling to me. But it really upsets me, individuals blaming Ginger Alden. Ginger Alden 
had taken sleep medication that morning as well. Cause remember they went to bed in the morning time, which was nighttime for them. And right. she just went to sleep. The last time she spoke to Elvis was around in the nine o'clock in the morning hour. And he told her, she asked him what was wrong. And he said, I, I can't sleep. And then he told her he was going to the bathroom to read. If you listen to our episode last week with Kyle, we talked about Elvis's bathroom wasn't like our bathroom. Elvis's bathroom, he had like a little sitting area and it was, it was macked out. He tells her he's just going to go into his bathroom to read. And she says to him, okay, don't fall asleep. And he says, okay, I won't. And he goes in, shuts the door and she just goes back to sleep. And then when she woke up and she realized Elvis wasn't there, she, you know, she, she's not panicked. I mean, who would be panicked? Is the day they were going to leave for tour in that evening? Everybody's doing stuff around the house. So it is such a horrible thing to think about that this young girl, she's only 20 years old and she's only been with Elvis for nine months. Just the thought of that is so traumatic. And then to have people decades later constantly say nasty things about you because you just happened to be the one who was there that day. Well, with the fame comes the blame, right? Well, she she wasn't really famous. I mean, her fiance was. Fame by by association. That's true. Right? There is a lot of finger pointing when it comes to Elvis's death. And that is what's so mind-boggling. They they don't just do it to Ginger. People have done it to Priscilla. People Mm -hmm. have done it to the guys that, that worked for him. There's a lot of finger pointing going on just how do you, boggles how do you save, my mind how do you save someone from themselves exactly you know it comes back exactly. to that doesn't? there has to be even though it's no fault of anyone's in the way that he died i do feel and i think a lot of people understand this when someone close to you dies and especially in such a way that it wasn't expected. You as a human being who has empathy and compassion and love, there's a sense of guilt that you just carry because you're always going to wonder, what if? What What if I did this? What if I had said this to him? Even though logically speaking, we know the outcome would still be the same because that's how the universe works in that sense. You can't change it, but we'd like to think that we could have sure but it instead of it making us feel better it just torments us more so maybe that's when they start finger pointing you know what i mean it starts to get to be a a deflection on feelings look elvis presley was responsible for his own death because of his drug use the drug use contributed to his death right so then you go back. Then it goes back to who knew, how long did they know, and why didn't they? Why didn't they work towards uh, doing something about it? When you were talking with Dave Hedler, his anger towards certain people because they knew about the drugs and they didn't do anything. At least Dave was trying to keep things in a positive thing with the martial art, help Elvis try to keep him squared away. Well, I think but, Dave, I think Dave was more angry at Elvis's father than any yeah. anyone else because I think he felt as the father, the father could have done and said more because look, you know, losing a friend, it may hurt, it's going to hurt, but you can move on. No one's going to just disown their father. And I think Dave was saying, you know, if anyone could get through to Elvis, it should be his dad. Why didn't his dad do something? Why didn't his dad say anything? And Vernon said after Elvis died, he had no idea. Dave Hebler says that's not true, that he, he did know. Yeah. I would think all the signs would be there. But then again, my research and talking to the, some of the people that were there during that time, there were conversations. There were individuals trying to get him to stop using so many prescription drugs. But Elvis had convinced himself that he needed them. I think that he was almost afraid of what if he couldn't get off drugs. I I don't think Elvis, Elvis was not someone that liked to fail. And I think he had, there was a fear there. However, in some of the books I've read, he had told some of, of the guys that it was going to be on this tour that he was going to clean himself up. He was going to get straight. Ginger Alden, his, his fiance at the time, she says that Elvis would talk to her about their upcoming wedding, talk about their future together, talk about having a child. Uh, His cousin, Billy Smith, 
says some things that Elvis told him about futuristic plans. I mean, this, this wasn't a man who thought he was going to die. Right. I don't think that it was a matter of being suicidal. Yeah. You know? I don't believe that. I and because you know you're a parent. I'm a parent. You as a parent, you would have to be in some horrible headspace to end your life. And right. I, I don't see Elvis Presley being someone who was at that point in which he thought the only way out was to die. Absolutely. Why so don't next- we take a break? And okay. when we come back. We will talk about where you were when you found out Elvis Presley had died. It was it was devastating. I wrote about it in my book. Um, I I was in denial. Um, it it uh, was something that none of us expected. I it, it's still hard still hard to this day, uh, but it was a very tragic tragic sad day. When the road gets rough and you had enough Too tired to make it alone Bring it on home Bring it on home And you reach your peak on a losing streak Life won't throw you a bone Bring it on home From Vegas and said, return to Vegas the pilot, but they didn't tell him why. The pilot said, well, I have to stop and refuel because I can't just turn around and go back. So we stopped in Pueblo, Colorado to refuel. So I got out and I walked outside the plane and uh, and the trombone player, Marty Harrell, Marty came up to me and said, James, I'm going to go call Vegas and see if I can get a, you know, find out something. I said, oh, okay. So my wife was in Louisiana. I I called, uh, I was going to go call her, and I didn't make it to the phone. Marty was on his way back, and he came up to me, and he had tears in his eyes, and he put his arms around me and said, Elvis died. I couldn't believe it. I don't remember who else showed up, and they took us in the room. We were sitting there waiting to find out what was going on, and about 20 minutes later, Dr. Nick came into the, into the room where we were, and he walked, and he said, Elvis is gone. And... Uh, It was hard, and uh, the PR guy from the hospital uh, wanted to know if I want to make the announcement to the press, and uh, I said, I'll try. But meanwhile, uh, Dr. Nick said, don't say anything to anybody yet. I'm going to go back to the house and tell Vernon before he hears it on the news. So he, the police department was there, and they took Dr. Nick out to the hospital and out to the house. And uh, meanwhile, I got on the phone and called uh, Priscilla to tell her that uh, Elvis was gone. I don't know. It was like, it was like you know, are you kidding me? Don't do Because we'd get around all the time, you know. And he was in the hospital lots of times, and he always made it through. He always came out. Sometimes he would go to the hospital just to get away from everybody, put all the blackout drapes in, and um, just, you know, stay there for a few days just to destimulate. Mm-hmm. And so we were all used to that. And I think that being in, being in my own world still shocked. Bring it on home. Bring it on home. Bring it on home. Bring it on home. Whether you're black or white, whether you're country, redneck, or freak, young or old, from Moscow, London, or Memphis, Elvis Presley will still be the king of rock and roll to me. Welcome back to the Jungle Room. I am Jamie Kay. And I'm Mike Ford. Mike, where were you the day that you found out Elvis Presley had died? I was doing the evening shift on a broadcast school station in Tacoma, Washington. I'm trying to remember the exact time that I heard it. So what time would it have been in Memphis? He died at 3.30 p.m. that afternoon. So they arrived at the hospital at 2.55, and 
they finally stopped working on him and it was 3 30 p.m 3 30 p.m in memphis mm -hmm. okay they announced his death at 4 p.m that day that would have been like what 1 p.m your time in washington yes two hours so it would have been like two o'clock two o'clock okay because so i was in the station but I wasn't on the air yet because I was starting at four and going till seven. Mm -hmm. All right. So I was at a radio station in Tacoma, Washington, an educational station. You'll love the call letters too, Jamie K. It was K-T-O-Y F-M. <laughs> so it was pretty huge for being a school station. And I wasn't on the air yet, but uh, they used to have this thing called a teletype. You knew something big was happening when the bell would ring. The big events, it was five bells. So there was five bells went off in the, on the teletype. And I remember our news guy for the day, Mark McIntosh, and he had the voice of God, right? We immediately started playing all Elvis tunes. And it was just like this, wow, is it real? Is it true? So we were all in shock. And I had my broadcast teacher at the time, uh, his name is Lee Perkins. And Lee Perkins, in the 60s, had been one of the top, four, top, top 40 dudes in Seattle at a place called KJR. And they were a part of bringing Elvis um, to Seattle to open the Space Needle for the World's Fair. So that was kind of an interesting connection there. But Pat O'Day, my, my other uh, mentor who passed away recently at like 85 down in Washington, he was part of a business called Concerts West, and they had the contract to promote Elvis on the West Coast. Any place that, uh, I don't know if that covered Vegas, but anything in the West, West of the Mississippi, I believe, Pat O'Day was helped put on Elvis shows. So I thought that was another, another interesting Elvis connection, because Pat had been at our broadcast school years and years and years ago. Uh, Lee Perkins was my teacher, so... There's kind of like this, what is that, six degrees of Kevin Bacon thing? Yeah. Everybody knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. Yeah, no, it was sad to say the least. I mean, we were all pretty much in shock. And still, you know, because we're all trying to become big radio DJs. I mean, that afternoon really reminded me how many hits he had. I even snuck in a couple gospel songs as we got into the evening. So that was nice. It's kind of a always was a part of my... Um, you know, when I was listening as a kid in the 60s, Elvis was on the radio on all the Seattle stations, always a part of my life. And then when I got to go down uh, years later in the 90s to uh, St. Jude Hospital in Memphis, and I had to, I had to go to Graceland. Mm -hmm. I had to go over there. And that was just uh, it was kind of full circle from that day at the radio state at the school station to see where he was. It's very interesting. You know, even becoming a part of this podcast is kind of how that happened has been very interesting, too, you know, and to realize how Elvis has kind of in, been intertwined in my life. It's just, right. you know, and all the cool people that we've got to meet since yes. we've been doing the podcast. Yes, we have. We've we've met a lot of wonderful and awesome people. What do you think, Mike, now that you've you've been around for a while and you, you remember the day that Elvis died? Do you believe the same way I do that Elvis is bigger now than he was in the 70s? I think so. There's no pressure to be bigger. That is true. Right? He doesn't have to. He doesn't have anything to prove anymore. Go back a little bit to his insecurity and Elvis really underestimated his fans i don't think he fathomed the way in which he is still being honored today i don't think he he had that inclination he was so worried about that upcoming tour because of the book elvis what happened he, he didn't know what his how his fans were going to be towards him it's so tragic in the elvis presley story is that he really did not see or grasp how much he was loved and his fans loved him unconditionally. They still do. We're still talking about him 43 years later. There's podcasts, there's YouTube channels, there's documentaries and movies, books. Elvis Presley is 
he is more than a man and he's more than an image. I mean, he has almost been portrayed in a godlike fashion, which fascinates me. To be honest, it fascinates me because this wasn't a man who had any upbringings of being successful and in this type of wealth. And he became a huge star around the world. It's just, it's mind boggling. And if you allow yourself to continue to think about it, you start going down a rabbit hole and you you can drive yourself crazy trying to, you know, why this guy, what made him so special? And Elvis Presley would torture himself, ask the same question. And it goes back to, he had that magical quality in which he was able to resonate with so many different individuals, no matter what their backgrounds were, no matter what race they were, he was able to connect to them. Even with people that say they don't like him, there's still a connection there. Yeah. And that is magical. This is Elvis week, August, 2020 is not the Elvis week that so many of us had expected. So many of us that thought that we were going to be down in Memphis right now. I thought I was going to be recording live from Memphis, Tennessee this year If anything, you know, we can look back on this year and with this pandemic and so much craziness going on in America right now. And I hope that if we can take anything away from Elvis week and a lot of the tragedies that we have seen in this past year, we're not promised tomorrow. And it doesn't matter how famous or how rich and how much you are idolized. You're not promised tomorrow. I hope that anyone that is listening to this takes a moment, hug that person that you love, call that friend you haven't spoke to in a while, make up with that brother that gets on your nerves. Life is too short. Embrace it while you can. Amen. All right, Mike Ford. I think this wraps up another episode of the Jungle Room podcast brought to you by Sassy Girl Apparel in Horn Lake, Mississippi. I'm Jamie Kay. I'm Mike Ford. Until next time. We'll see you in the jungle room. When the road gets rough and you're heading up Too tired to make it alone Bring it on home Bring it on home And you reach your peak on a loop Bring it on home. 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 Mm-hmm. You're in doubt and you're all strung out. Your heart is turning to stone.
Worried about keeping up with your fave friends all summer? Or posting every perfectly pink sunset you see? Don't sweat the connect. You can have it made in the shade with four lines of unlimited data for $100 a month. Scroll the staycation pics, find your new go-to takeout spot, or catch some rays on video chat. Whatever you and the crew are into, all the data makes it all that much better. Smile. You're on Cricket. Cricket Core acquired on four lines. Data speed limited to three megabits per second. Cricket may slow data speeds when the network is busy. Additional fees, usage, and restrictions apply.